hobbyist breeder. <laughs> That's, uh, and he is the, um, at the origin of the silver quails that are known as the Schofield Silver Collection. So he's going to tell us about how he bred those quails to, to get to that result and the challenges that he faced. We also have with us Jeff Maddox, Baylor Lansden, and Rachel Teller, all animal nutritionists at Fertrell. And they will cover with us the uh, what is good nutrition for quails. They'll show us um, ideal rations for quails, what you are trying to uh, you know, to what you need to meet their nutritional requirements. And then we'll take questions. If there are some questions that I see come through as we're talking, if they are really re very re relevant to what has just been said, I might just bring them up at that time, but we're gonna try to let everybody talk about what they need to talk about. And then we'll take questions from, uh, from the audience. So the first questions, question here, uh, for Perry is this one. Could you uh, give us a little background on who you are and how and why you started breeding quails? Well, I'm a retired teacher. I taught school for 38 years and I've been subbing for the last seven. I grew up in Nova Scotia on a small dairy farm. I always had chickens and I always wanted to get quail. So I got my first quail 1970 and I had them shipped in actually from Mars Farms in California were the first ones I ever had. At that time Mars Farms were the largest breeders of quail in in the States. Mm -hmm. Then I went to a spot where I moved to Quebec and other places. I got back into Quaternic Quails again about 1979, and then I moved to Alberta to a teacher, so I couldn't have anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in 1986, I was teaching at a small country school, and the University of British Columbia, BC, had what they called the Quail Facility. At that time, they were breeding 36 different types of quail. They had about 20 different colors. Then they had naked necks. They had frills where the feathers are all fluffy. They had, they were breeding them, the students were experiments. They had one quail that had one blue eye and one other color eye. So I ordered eggs from them. They wouldn't sell to the public, but they would sell to people in the school who were teaching kids. So I ordered the eggs from him, and at that time I ordered six colors. I got the silvers from them. I got the blue egg, the Saladin eggs. Saladin eggs in the U.S. all come from me. There was none until I did my export to Robbie uh, at uh, Mo uh, James Marie Farm in Louisiana, when he took them to the States. And uh, blue eggs from them. I also had a quail that laid a white egg. A quaternic, not a bob white, a quaternic. So when I first got the Cerberus, they had a deadly gene. It, you had to breed Cerberus to normals, to ferals, in order to get live chicks. If you bred Cerberus to Cerberus, 50% of anything that hatched would die in, or got fertile, would die in the cell or die within three or four days after hatching. It, it was that lethal a gene. But being up in northern Alberta, <laughs> there's very few people, I'm five and a half hours north of Edmonton. There's very few people up here had quail. So I had six different colors. So what I would have to do is I would have to cross out the different colors to keep feral usually to breed back to keep my colors going. So over about a 10 per year period, I crossed the silver so to all these different colors and bred them back. So someplace within that 10 years, the lethal gene basically disappeared. So I could breed Cerberus to Cerberus and get really nice colored Cerberus without them all dying on me. Hmm. That's where the Cerber Cotardi came from. Now, I have found anybody who's breeding Cerber Quail, 
you can do up to six generations with no problems. You, you, you'll get a little smaller probably. But if you go to that seven or eight generation, the lethal gene seems to start appearing again. You'll start having a lot of deaths in the, in the egg and chicks that die. So I tell everybody who contacts me, do five or six generations, then you have to buy new blood or you got to cross out to feral again and start over. The blue eggs were in my flock for the first 10 years, the Celadon eggs. And then it kind of died out, but it, it, that gene was in all my colors. So about 10 years, I didn't have any Celadon eggs. So then I sold it. I sold a bird to a guy in British Columbia, a friend of mine. He called up and he was all excited. He said, one of my birds laid a blue egg. What's the matter with it? So after convincing him that he really had to give it back to me, <laughs> I was able from that one bird to get the Seldon eggs going in my flock again. I've had the one line of silvers since 1986 unbroken. Hmm. Right from my original purchase of silvers till now. It's been an unbroken line. I've never had that color die out on me. I've always had silvers. I've crossed out to seven different lines of ferals to bring in new blood, which is, but I've, I've been able to keep the silvers alive going on almost 36 years, that line. That's interesting. That's interesting. So it took... How long did it take you to, uh, here, I'm going to put the next question so that you can maybe expound a little bit on what you just said. How long did it take to, uh, to the place where the, that line was stable enough that you could, you know, breed them to whatever extent you just explained? Probably a seven or eight years because I've, you can do a, you can do in Coternics. I've done six generations in one year, if you really keep them close. Mm -hmm. So within seven or eight years, I'd probably make 15 crosses out to different colors and back and to get them. Seven or eight years, the lethal gene just seemed to disappear. They were pretty stable by the 10th year I had them. So I've had them stable almost for 26 years. But okay. I do warn people it will come back if you inbreed too much. Mm -hmm. All right. So you also... Um raise other type of poultry but i think you've raised pretty much all types of poultry I had raised, uh, at one time i had 26 different types of pheasants i've had at different times eight colors of peacocks i've had two types of guinea hens i've had the regular guinea hens and then i had the jumbo french if you ever seen them they're like three or four times the size of a regular guinea. However, they were so noisy, my neighbor almost a mile down the road was complaining. Mm -hmm. My wife told me I had to get rid of them or I was sleep, sleeping on the sofa. <laughs> All right. Like they were, the French ones I had was almost as big as a small turkey. Wow. Uh, I've had eight colors of turkeys. So I have probably raised 14 types of bantams probably 18 types of standards. My partner I'm with right now, we have 10 breeds of standards as uh, chickens as well as the quail. Mm -hmm. So from a breeder's perspective, what are the advantages of having quails over all those types of poultry? Quails, uh, they only take 17 days to hatch. Okay. At seven weeks of age, they're adult, they're laying eggs and will breed. Okay. By 10 weeks of age, they basically have raised, reached their full size, if you want to read them out then. Uh, the turnover, uh, for people who cannot eat normal chicken eggs, mm -hmm. they can eat quail eggs. I, we, we've been selling at the local family market. I had a guy came in a couple of weeks ago, and he was looking at it, and he said, I wish I could eat those. He said he hadn't had eggs for 30 years. Mm -hmm. so I said, you take them home. I said, try one or two if you don't get sick. Try the other. We sell a two dozen package. 
He's been back twice now, two weekends in a row, to buy four dozen each weekend for him and his family because he couldn't eat them. Mm -hmm. I also had a, for years, I had a pace, a, a cancer patient. Her sister, every spring, would buy 10 to 15 quail hens. They didn't want to raise them. They only wanted them for the spring or summer because she was having problems eating normal eggs and they'd buy the 10 or 15 for her sisters to have eggs. They did that for 10 straight springs every year, 10 straight. And then they stopped and I figured maybe she didn't survive past it. Mm -hmm. But they kept the family, her husband and wife and two kids, kept them in all the eggs they wanted. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, easy, they're easier to digest for people than you believe. Yeah, it has a different protein. I, I did research once. I can't remember what it said. But there's a different protein in quail eggs than the normal chickens. Quail mm -hmm. eggs also have a larger yolk in comparison to a chicken egg. Chicken egg, you have a lot of white. A lot right. of white in the egg. Quail mm -hmm. eggs, you have way more yolk and less white. Right. So when we bake, we, if we want a medium egg, we... We'd use three eggs, and otherwise, if we were one a large egg, we use four. I should mention all eggs are not standard-sized eggs. If you look online, they say eggs are 10 to 11 grams normally. Our birds produce normally anywhere from 14 to 16. I have been working on increasing egg size, and... The weight in the birds, probably for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Now, one problem for those people who buy jumbo quail, if you buy jumbo quail and you do not weigh your eggs and you do not weigh your breeders, the tendency in coturnics is to get smaller. The tendency when raising them is to revert back to the normal size. Normal males are anywhere from 180 to 220 grams. Normal hens are anywhere from 200 to 240. Okay. A jumbo male is considered anything over 250. Males are smaller. I have several males in different colors who are 300, 310, 315. So that's way above the start of the jumbo. Jumbo hens start at 300 grams in my jumbo pins unless they weigh 350 they don't make it to the breeding pin but i weigh my eggs i never set an egg under 14 to 15 gram ever and i weigh my breeders but i've had people buy from me and two or three years they say well my quail are small but they, they never, you have to do selective breeding. It's worse than chickens. That's the worst problem with coturnics. If you don't weigh your breeders and eggs, they're going to get smaller on you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. And then I wanted to get you to talk about the cages that you use and you build. I saw them on another show and they looked, they looked yeah. quite neat. I think I deleted them. I do my own cages. I buy wire from Home Depot. It's a black coated wire. You can buy in two foot or three foot, 50 foot or 100 foot lengths. It's black coated and I use it's all a half inch by inch. My cages are 47 and a half inches long because my, my uh, braces I use are 48. So 47, 47. They're 18 inches deep. The back of the cage is 10 inches. The front of the cage is 11 and a half inches long. The reason is the last five inches on the cage are 10, and then they tilt so the eggs will roll over. Okay. So the eggs are, I find comfortably my large quail, I, can, I fit 10 to 12 hens and three males in one of those with no problems. Every cage I make, because I'm, I'm very in more to anything in working on colors and stuff. Every one of those cages is made so you can do, you can have a drop down, you can drop down, and you can fit it into three separate breeding cages. So if I'm very into doing a new color, I'll take one cage, drop it down, and I'll have a male and two or three hens 
of that color and maybe two different lines of it in each of the pins. So I'll have three pins I'm bleeding from to work on a new color. Right now we have, let me see, three, six, we have 10 of those. So if I wanted to subdivide them, we could have 30 individual breeding cages. Mm -hmm. And you use those, you use those Costco shelves. I, I bought from Costco, they're heavy. <laughs> yeah, my cages are expensive. <laughs> I bought from Costco those heavy uh, garage beams, which are four feet wide, and they come with the, they're, they're the heavy duty ones. You go to Costco, you'll know what I mean. And uh, I made them so I can put three pairs of cages and under each cage, I have my drop-in boxes, which are two feet, roughly two feet by 20 inches, four inches tall, that's set under each cage. I can then slide those out, dump them, put new shavings and put them back. And uh, it works very really good. I'll have to, I looked for my pictures I had, the ones you've seen when I was selling them. Yes, if people want to find that video, it's on YouTube that you recorded with uh, Terry McGleish. Yeah, he has a really nice presentation there and you can actually uh, see them because he showed them from different angles. So yeah, see, I had all those, at one time I was selling them, mm -hmm. but it got, like I was selling the three cages without the wooden boxes, you could make those. The three cages and the, the beams, I was selling them for $300 for the setup. Mm -hmm. My selling point was if you, did, if you didn't want to keep Quail out of the wall, you had great heavy duty shelves for your garage. <laughs> but that's yep. expensive for a quail cage for just three cages. And then the prices went up on everything. Mm -hmm. So it was basically costing me three twenty five to make the cage. Right. Right. <laughs> and I I would with, it takes a lot of time to make those. I would have had to sell them for five or six hundred and that was unreasonable for the average person. Right. Right. But if people see what you've done in that video, I think it's something that they could make for themselves. It would be oh, they could. They, yeah. They'd have to order the wire. And when you go to Home Depot, they don't usually, sh they don't show it on the site. You won't, you have to really search for uh, one inch by a half inch. It doesn't come up easy. It, I, I didn't know for a couple of years that it was hard to find them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in the back of the inventory or something. Right. Right. And, and you have to order. Generally, they do not keep any on hand of it. And it's easy to wash because it's coated. It's coated. I, yeah. You know, I take my birds out. Then we got a cement floor in the building. Once the birds are out, I clean out the boxes. I take the boxes outside. Uh, my boxes are done with verifane on them. Two coats of verifane on the inside. Mm-hmm. So I could take them out and I can rinse off the cage with the holes and squeeze it out. And on boxes, I can take outside and wash off, they look like new. Right, right. So then uh, let's start with, you know, starting, you've got some eggs. What is your favorite incubator? Or is there any that you would not recommend? Are there any that are specific for quails or can you just use your chicken incubator? My favorite incubators, <laughs> <laughs> Not the cheap ones, are the sportsmen. Um, at the way I have my setup set up with my trays and my egg trays, because I got jumbo eggs, I couldn't, I can't use the normal quail egg trays that you normally put in. Mm -hmm. I had to buy in the states. I had, and I couldn't order them. I had to get some a friend in the states order them. I buy those green uh, chucker egg crates. They hold eighty. So I can get 200 eggs in a flat. Is, uh, here. So I can put 600 of those in my incubator at one time, or I can put uh, 300 chicken eggs minus 12, because each uh, rebel holds 96 cricket eggs. I love the sportsmen. I have no problem with them. So is that the... That's one of them right there. If you yeah. count those, there's 80 eggs in that green flat. And you use those in, you use those in your incubator. Yep. Yeah. I, I have 
it will hold two and then there's a space. So I cut one up to make two rows. To, I think it's two rows on the side. So I get X, X, actually uh, 200 eggs on each level. The two flats give me 160. Then with the pieces I cut, you can get 200 in the sportsman in a tray. Mm -hmm. But you can see there that tray is, is bigger than the normal quail egg tray. tray. Right. Okay, so now I lost, I lost Rachel. You locked me. If there was an incubator, I really didn't care for. Yes, is there one that you would not recommend? Okay, there are thousands and thousands of people who have good luck with them. I cannot get a styrofoam incubator to work for me to save my life. I just don't get good hatches. Could be because of where I live, that maybe we're above sea level quite a bit and the humidity is very low. But I can take I can take a hundred eggs and put into my sportsman. I'll get ninety-five chicks at the eggs are fertile. Or a hundred. I can put what is it, seventy in a sportsman and like a half. I and I have people that swear by them, but I don't like the styrofoam ones. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you sometimes we have to kind of play around and see what works for us. And yeah, it really depends on where you have your incubator, where you got a set, right? Your humidity is in your house, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's really affected affects the styrofoam way more than the sportsman. Right. I had my sportsman in my garage this spring, and it was forty four degrees in the garage. Mm -hmm. The sportsman was steadily running at 99.8, and I was hatching, this is in the first of March, I was hatching chicks like crazy, and my mm -hmm. actual garage was only 44 degrees, because it gets too expensive to heat it up here. So I just kept it warm enough, not for froze, or, right. you know, the sportsman would pop a milk. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so here, what are the ideal brooding conditions for quail? So what's the temperature, the humidity levels? Is, is it different from chickens? And how long is the brooding? I've never done it different than my chickens. I often have when the day loads because I have mixed hatches. I'll have chickens and quaternies hats at the same time. And for the first week, they're okay. After the first week, the chickens are too big. <laughs> but you know, if I'm hatching one day, I dump them into a brooder. Mm -hmm. I don't use heat bulbs in my brooders. I use a 100 watt light bulb with a pie plate reflector. If it's a bigger brooder, I might have two or three. Works great. Inside mm -hmm. a building, not outside. So, yeah, I might have 40 quail hatching and maybe two dozen chickens. And if I don't have another pin, I can toss them together for a week with no problem. Problem was when I had button quail. Because the button quail are the size of a big bumblebee, right? Like, mm -hmm. Even that, when they hatch, you just couldn't put them with chicken chicks. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. But the, the quaternic quail, people do not realize how tough the quaternic quails are. I see people all the time saying, well, I got to heat my garage. I got to have heat for them. I got to have this for them. The quaternic quail started out as a wild quail. They're actually the quail they talk about in the Bible. They can stand, if you condition them to the weather, they can stand what you wouldn't believe. I had pelvic the males in October in northern Alberta, which is not warm. I had no pins, room in my breeding pins in the building. They didn't sell at the auction because nobody wanted club males, so I took them home. My golden pheasant pin was 26 feet long six feet tall, eight feet wide, and I have a six four house on the end. So I said, well, you know, I, I can't keep him. So I put extra straw in the house part. I tossed in October, I tossed this dozen mail in there, right? My pheasants up here, once we get snow, when I had them, once they got snow, they got no water. Because you can't, you put water in at 35, 30 below and it freezes in a half an hour up here, right? Once the snow came and stayed at least three or four inches, my pheasants lived on snow. Did fantastic. Then in the spring, when the snow started to melt, I might have to put water in and 
break it open. But my pheasant said no problem. You had to watch it. Sometimes a young pheasant wouldn't eat snow. You had to take him in the building and get him warmed up and a couple of days toss him up till he was ready. I left those dozen males in the pheasant pen. I figured eh, I might have one in the spring. We had, I think that when we had eight or nine days, it went minus 40. In March, when I went into the pen to see how many I had left, there was 11 out of the 12 males. And I think the one that died, I stepped on in the thick straw. <laughs> I think I killed him because they burrowed down in the straw. Well, you'd see them on 30 below. They'd be all huffed up, but they'd be out in the snow walking around if it wasn't windy. They're tough. People have no idea how tough they are. Well, that's interesting for, especially for Alberta, because we get them um, cold. We get it cold, yes. But they have so, to be. Con you have to condition them to it. You can't take them from the building and toss them out in November. Like these guys were out early October, so you know it was twenty degrees, ten degrees at night. So their feathers got conditioned and they got conditioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long do you keep your breeding birds? Eight months. I usually turn my flock over twice a year. The reason is they start laying at 17, so basically two months. Mm -hmm. At six months, they've laid a, they, if you treat it the right and give them proper feed, they've laid a lot of eggs, a mm -hmm. lot of eggs. And they're starting to slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then what will happen, I found after nine or 10 months, they'll take a little break maybe in a week or two and then they'll lay again. Fantastic layers. But the thing is, I found up to eight months of age, you generally have no breaks. So I sell my breeders. They're still good breeders for anybody else who wants them. Mm -hmm. But then I put in. So normally I put my new quail in the case. I'm doing it right now. This set. They'll start laying. Uh, they'll start laying really good by the end of December. Generally, I have lots of eggs to sell at the farmer market. And in February, second week of February, I'll start shipping hats and eggs all over Canada. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And here, what kinds of quails are you working with now? What colors do you have? Right now, I have my silvers. I have Phil. I have Jumbo Texas A and M's from the U.S. from Robbie Richard. His line, I've been keeping it going. Uh, pansies, Tibetans, Rosettas. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to breed a color of uh, red German pastels, which are salad on layers <laughs> that lay blue eggs. I found that my first German pastels, when you hatched them, you could get eight or nine different colors. They, they were all kind of kind of light or something. So I picked the weird color I wanted. And I think we're on generation seven or eight. And now we're getting basically a, a reddish color bird that lays 60% of the chicks I hatch will lay sell it on eggs, blue eggs. Mm -hmm. And then a uh, couple years ago, I received a gift from a gentleman in the US and he sent me some black conturnics. Now, they spent 14 days in the mail. That's So I they got here. I didn't think. He sent me eight or nine colors. I didn't think I would get anything to hatch. All of the black eggs, I got three chicks. From those three chicks, I built my flock up. I have sold this year black hats and eggs. Probably, geez, must be getting close to 100 dozen for my black quail. Mm -hmm. My Texas A&M's and my black celadons are the best layers I have. Fantastic layers. Mm -hmm. And the blacks, when I got them, were regular size, like the, the smaller. I've got them almost bred after nine generations, almost up to I'm getting 50 to 70% will make jumbo size. Hmm. So, so my last question for you, are there for people who want to start, you know, with quails or start breeding them, are there resources of, out there that you would recommend they look into, you know, videos, YouTube channels, books, 
Which there's there's some fantastic stuff on YouTube and uh, uh, Terry McGee has some fantastic stuff. Uh, I can't think. I not I can't think well, of another big breeder down there. I can't. His name won't come to me. It's Coternix Corner. That's the YouTube channel that Terry that had. That Terry had. Yeah, yeah, this is the this is the other big uh, breeder of Coternix in the state. I talked to the guy. They they actually invited me for next year to go to Quail Thon. Uh, Quail, what I think that's what it got. Mm -hmm. Quail Thon or Thon in Ohio. So I'm probably going to be down in the states for that. But I can't oh, yeah. think. Green. I think his name is Green. His last name. They okay. had a big deal. Mm -hmm. They have lots of colors. Yes. Yeah. Uh, his site has some good information. There, right. What I would suggest, when you go to one site, don't only go by one site. You really got to do your work. You got to go to probably five to ten sites mm -hmm. and take everything you get with a grain of, a grain of salt. My biggest complaint I have is people that only have trail for a year or two consider themselves experts and start putting all this stuff online. I, I online. I, I've had it for 36 years straight. Mm -hmm. Last spring, somebody said something online that was wrong, and, and I politely told them that, you know, that really won't work. You should tell people this. And all I got for a week was nasty letters saying I didn't know anything. Yeah. So, like I said, go to a minimum of five sites. Some of the some of the homesteader sites, I can't think. I I don't go to them, but I've read excellent stuff on the homesteader sites. A lot of them are pushing toward trail because they take less space. They give you meat cheaper than growing up roosters. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some there's some excellent homesteader sites in the U.S. Yeah, yes, I've actually found several of them uh, looking for in some, some information. Yeah, really good. And then I'd stick to the big guys because they're raised enough that generally their stuff is okay. Yes. So I do have one question that I'm going to take here and then we'll move to um, Jeff and uh, Baylor and Rachel. For jumbo quails, what age do you find they reach their maximum weight? Okay, they start laying at seven to eight weeks. I find that basically, if you're feeding them good by 10 or 11 weeks, they will be there. Hens reach, it, hens reach their full weight probably a week or 10 days sooner than the males do. Hens, hens are the larger ones than the males. So, yeah, about 10 weeks for jumbles. They basically won't get much bigger at that time. I have a chart online, several sites you can go download. It shows all the jumbo weights and it compares the Grahams with this Canada and the rest of the world. It compares to what that weight is in ounces. So for somebody who's working with ounces in the States, they can go to this and they can say, oh, it's 10 and a half ounces. That's 280 grams. So then they can know whether, because worldwide, uh, the jumbles are usually considered 250 for a male to start 300 for a hit. Used that for, since I found it 30 years ago. So that's kind of the standard. So if they find my chart or if they want to email me, I'll send it to them. It does, the, it does all the weight by Graham down right up to, I think it goes to a pound something. Right. So I put uh, Perry's email uh, right here on the screen. If you want to uh, write it down, I'll put it in the comments too uh, when the show is, uh, is over. So now let me see here. Hey, wait. Why, yeah. why, what, Perry, why do you not keep them any longer than eight months? I mean, I mean, what is their effective lifespan? Did you oh, keep them longer? I've had them up to two or three years, but I okay. find the maximum eggs, every day egg, up to eight to ten months, you will get an egg every day. 
Okay. If you're feeding good feed like the stuff we mix from you guys, no problem getting. But I've found that after that 10 month, they don't stop. Like you still get five to six eggs a week. But you're not getting seven eggs every week. Uh, and no problem. I could keep them probably till the air in the colder, until they go in the first moat, right? But I just find when I'm selling lots of eggs, I don't keep a fantastically big farm. Plus, I get a good, I get a good price selling my breeders at eight months. Okay, so you have eight a market, months. you have a market for the mature birds at eight months. For the mature hens, I I get ten to fifteen dollars depending on whether it's closer to a regular or it's a big right. jumble. It that makes sense if you got a market, but I mean, you could keep them out to three years old if you wanted to, right? I have had them, but I'll tell you, at three years old, the egg production is down to three, four eggs a week when the ones I had. Okay. It's like a chicken. Yeah, you, you keep a chicken for a year and 15 months, and then egg production starts to drop. Right. That's why they sell them off, right? Mm -hmm. Same right. thing with a quail. If this egg production drop, and okay. where I have, I have eight cows and 10 pins. If I kept them all for the same age, I have noticed a definite drop, like 20% after 10 months of age. Yeah, I was just wondering why you didn't keep them any longer. It's like, oh, you, know. you could. Lots yeah. of people do. Yeah, okay. But I, I just found, since I can sell hens anytime I want, I can sell quail hens. I could put my whole flock online tomorrow and probably sell them in a day. The hens. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy males. <laughs> Why? They're not big enough. Well, they're smaller for me. Yeah. And you only need, well, I never go more than one male to four hens, ever. I've never done that. Okay. I like to be sure I have, but I know people that keep one male to eight or nine hens and get fertile eggs. Hmm. But since I sell hats and eggs, I like to go one male to to four or one male to three <clears throat> so you're you're doing this more as a i mean you do it because you enjoy it but you also do it more as a business you know um to cycle those birds around and get them in get them out and so on right so yeah they, they gotta I, I like it my wife said if you're gonna keep them they gotta pay for themselves <laughs> right okay yeah. that's what i was trying to get is like because i know some people are going to get attached to their favorite hen oh and then, you know what do you do right so i have a friend an older lady who has kept a pair of trail in their house i think they're going on five or six years old she gets maybe one egg every two weeks <laughs> but she just loves so they can get quite tame really tame you see this yeah they're pets at this point right so yeah, yeah. After, i have kept special hens like a I had a 450 gram hen. That's a huge quail. Yeah. I kept her for probably two years because <laughs> I bred every cow I got. It was a feral hen. I bred every cow I got to that hen. Bred them back together. You cross the chicks back together in the first generation. You get that cow and you get bigger birds because you had that 450 hen. I, yeah. I bred her to probably seven cows. Wow. That's so huge for a quail hen. That I mean, is. That's the biggest I've ever had, 450. Yeah, wow. I, I wanted to mention, too, that I have a new color. I was hoping to get pictures for you, but it wasn't a good day okay, where I was. Geez, it was windy and blowing. I like to put them out in the grass and take pictures, right, so they look nice. I took my bracks and I crossed them with my silvers. I took my bracks and crossed them with my feral. And then I took the chicks from those and bred them back together to see what would happen. That way, my bracks needed new blood. So that way I put two totally new bloodlines into these chicks. A lot of the chicks are coming out almost like a red rosetta, but I am getting some solid gun middle gray. Not from like my sober colors I had before, although it could be a sober variation, but they're really a deep gray. Hmm. So I'm hoping to have pictures for those to put online in the next week or two if the weather gets nice. Because yeah. I haven't shown them for anybody yet. Well, so we have exclusive information tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I probably will get 50 emails now tonight. <laughs> Somebody will say something. 
<laughs> so let's uh, move to the this question for whoever wants to take it. So how does the nutritional requirements for quail differ from other types of poultry? So, you know, overall, uh, let's say you have several types of poultry. Can you feed your, how would you modify your, say your chicken ration to make, uh, to make sure your quails have everything they need? What do they, you know, what do they need that's specific to them? We know, uh, you know, turkeys need more, need more, uh, protein than chickens. And it's a mistake you don't want to make. Um, uh, ducks need more niacin. So what, uh, what, for the, what is for the quail? Quail need over 26% I found to lay good. That's the, bi that's the biggest problem with northern Alberta. The only feed I can buy that is 26% if we don't make our own. The only feed I can buy is turkey starter. 26. That's it. if I buy Barton feed here, the most I can get is 26% crumble. Okay. Now, the quail do okay on that. I, I've had quail on that from the day they were chicks till the day they died. I, basically, they can do it. But what would be best would be 30%, they tell me, is the best you, if you can get it. Yeah, and Barry brings up a good point. And and so look, you know, as far as a quail starter, I've heard people looking for 36%, 32%, 30%, 28%, 26%. And you know, we've talked about it before on the show. It's really not the percent of protein. It's getting the right proteins in the right proportions and getting the amino acids correct. So you can start them on that 26%. And as long as you've got the 1.5, 1.6 methionine, and you've got the 0.65 to 0.7 lysine, and the 0.83 anine, 0.84, yeah, I mean, you can start the quail chick on that. And we were talking about it before the show started, you know, Angered, remember? You know, if yeah. you think about where quail derive from in the wild, when those, when those baby quail hatch out, you know, they're eating really the only thing that they're big enough to eat is insects, small insects, right? So, yep. you know, spiders, ants, things like that. So they're on a really high protein, but they're also a high amino acid type diet uh, because it that actually is more to the meat type protein side of things, you know, whether they find a worm, you know, um, but they're more on the insect side than they are the grain side of yep. the poultry world. So, um, yeah, I'm yeah. trying, Jeff, to share this uh, quail starter ration that you sent me, but for some reason it just won't work. Okay. Can you put it up on your screen and share it, and I'll allow that in. Let me get there. So, I, I shut that all down when I uh, after I sent it to you. Where to put it? I found it a minute ago. Okay, so how do I share? Do I just click on the present? Yes, click okay. on the present, and then you pick the window you want, and it's going to appear on my screen, and I'll put it up. Did it work? Yes, there you go. Okay, so now this this is more of a U.S. starter type formula, um, and down here we have easy access to the roasted soybeans. So you know we can use that. I I'm an unusual nutritionist. I like the fat level to be a little bit higher than what you're going to see in most commercial feeds. So seven eight percent somewhere in there I think is really good. Um, now I made this at a thirty percent to try and make everybody happy the ones who want 32 the ones who want 28 etc i don't feel that it needs to be that high but it, it it works um so this is on a ton basis but you can also look at it on a percent basis which would be 100 pounds 100 pounds 100 kilos 100 whatever you want to make it um <clears throat> you know we're using some soybean meal we're using some roasted soy 
a little bit of corn, but this is 55% protein just from soy. And then you got another seven and a half percent protein from fish meal. So this is a really, really high protein. Um, and then as we go down and we look like I was talking about, you know, the lysine at 1.88, the methionine at 0.65, the threonine, I actually went higher and put it at, you know, or it's up at 1.24. So those are really important numbers. Um, you know, in a, in a regular chick starter, <clears throat> your, your vitamin levels are going to be down, you know, 3,500 to 4,000 units per pound. This one is 6,200 or six, you know, 6,190 units of vitamin A, you know, 2,000 um, units of vitamin D. So, uh, you know, they, they do, look, they're so small and they grow so fast. Those nutritional levels have to be higher uh, in order for them to succeed, right? But every bite matters, you know, because they can only eat so much in a given day. And they're converting almost all of it. I mean, it just crazy growth factors. Yes. I have to say that that looks excellent, but maximum at any one time, I probably only have a hundred quail hens. Mm -hmm. So to mix that up, this for a hundred quail hen for us is not feasible. I have no. to say though, that the mixture you gave us for our chicks, our chick feed, Yep. We, we switched from the turkey starter to that measure, and the egg production went up. <laughs> better compared to the button ones. That's the good. Was yeah, yeah so, that's, what, that's what we're hoping to do. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's so we actually seen an increase in it for egg production. Also, the chicks were growing faster than they were growing on uh, the turkey starter. Good. That's what we want. Yeah. So I would love to be able to mix up a couple hundred pounds of that at one time, but you know, for a small, now that for somebody going into like an actual quail farm would be perfect. They can yeah. mix up and feed to that level. Well, I would expect that the uh, Futrell poultry nutri balancer that you put in the ration would make a difference because the vitamins are properly properly balanced they are more bioavailable than uh, the average uh, mineral and vitamin supplement that you'll find yeah so that's got to be a play yeah uh, like i said we feed the chick starter when we make up a batch we make up the batch of the, the layer of mass and for our layers and we feed the chick starters to our chick chicken chicks and to the quail mm-hmm absolutely no problem the quail like i said the quail have done good they grow fast yeah healthy it would be wonderful though if we could increase the protein properly but on a small batch like you know this his machine is big he mixes up a ton at a time or something mm -hmm. yeah yes so um we looked through that. Do you want to run through some of the other rations? Or do you want to move to the next question, Jeff or Baylor, Rachel? I'm not sure who. Whichever you'd prefer, Ingrid, that's fine. I mean, that, that was a good example. I mean, that's that's the quail starter. Um, you know, and there's, there's people that are mixing, you know, they go get the ingredients, right? And that they're mixing that quail starter up in their kitchen you know, with a Vitamix mixer, you know, they go get the corn and the different stuff and, you know, and they can literally mix up because, you know, how much feed is is a hundred, you know, quaternics going to eat, you know, in a, in a day or two. I mean, you know, five pounds is probably going to last them till they're big enough to go to grower feed. So uh, their intake's just not that high. So, let's say that people can't mix their own rations and they have to go purchase a, uh, a commercial ration. What should they look for? If they look at the label, what are the... You know, those nutrient levels were on that ration that I just put up there. So, um, you know, they can use like the protein, the amino acids, the vitamin levels, you know, they can use that as a comparison tool they're not going to find that on the shelf anywhere, you know, 
at the at the feed store, it, it's going to be extremely unusual for them to find all those nutrient levels because look, I over formulate and I know that that I'm guilty, you know. Um, but I also, you know, I'd rather you complain about me being too expensive than calling me and saying, "Hey, your thing didn't work and all my birds died." Which which complaint would you rather hear? Okay, right? So yeah. Um, that's I just, hear you. Yeah, that's just how I go at it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you have all three of those rations. If you want to add them in you know, to the show notes or something after the fact, so people have comparisons for sure. starter grower and layer. Yeah, know, I can do that. Or to look at. Maybe, maybe if it's easier, this is my email address. If you want to uh, email me, I'll be happy to email you those rations. It might yeah. be, you know, folks are welcome to contact us at livestock at .com, you know, if, if they want. Yeah. You let yeah. me put that up. Now look, we're not Perry. We are not coil experts. So don't ask us what to breed to what and how to do this and that. We're feed people and we're more than happy to help you with feed questions. We are not breeding quail breeding experts. Okay. So you're going to have to email Perry. Yep. There you go. This is livestock at .com for ration advice. Right. And I'm going to put this one back up. This is Perry's email for breeding advice. I love to get emails. Yeah. It might take me a day or two. Some days I get five or six. Sometimes I get enough for a week, and the next week I have 50 or 60. Ay, ay, ay. I get emails from Australia, Europe, every place. Oh, wow. So now, what are the time frame for each each stages? You know, starter from what week to what week, grower, uh, layer. When do you start for, you know, for chickens? It's kind of set, but what do you do for quails? Well, see, that goes back to the feed problem here. You can't, mm -hmm. get, uh, you can't get a separate grower lesson and you can't get a separate uh, layer lesson. You know, right. just can't buy them. All I can buy up here, if I don't use the chick starter we mix from Flotel, all I can get up here is 26%. So basically my quail start on the chick starter and they go to life on it. And I, I get a ton of eggs and mm -hmm. I every birds. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal. It would be ni really nice if we could get like a grower and then cut it down to a layer, but it's just not available any place I know of it in Canada. Right. Uh, Jeff, Perry, Perry, I mean, you're getting, you're getting such good growth rates. I don't know why you'd want to change it. You know, you're talking about quail 30% above the standard or the normal is yep. what you're breeding for. And you're achieving that. And, and earlier you said, man, the chicks are growing so fast and they're doing so well. That's that's I mean, what I said. That's why we don't we don't switch. We stay on your chicks out of the whole up. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, why why would I bother? If it's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just yeah. And that's what I did before when before we had your mix, we did that with the twenty six percent. More expensive to buy twenty six percent turkey starter than it is to buy layer lesson. Mm -hmm. But the higher protein, the birds did better. And then we, we switched from that to your chick started. The birds did even better again. <laughs> mm -hmm. and they don't lay good on 21% uh, scratch. No. 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 They're not going to. No, so, they don't. Yeah. I mean, no. down here, Ingrid, to answer your question, you know, normally we would go about two weeks on the starter and four weeks on the grower. Right. And that's what most people are doing and being happy with. And then somewhere, you know, beginning of week seven, something like that, they'll switch over to the layer expecting those first eggs to start showing up. But right. yeah, they, unless you have a really large quail farm to get those formulas that way, um, most people are doing what Perry's doing. So yeah. Yeah. It's basically that's, we're stuck in Canada with that. Yeah. <laughs> that's just, uh, that's most, just of, most of the people down here are stuck too, Perry. It's not just, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of access to quail feed around the country. So um, at least that's what I'm hearing. All right. So I have a question for 
from Christy. She is in southern Saskatchewan. I have my quail in cages similar to yours. They get turkey start at 26%. They get a dust bath regularly, but not every day, of dirt, ash, and a very small amount of DE. They are in groups of five to six hens in one room, and their accommodations are cleaned regularly. But my quails look ruffled, greasy. Is it not enough dust bath or over-servicing, or perhaps the feed just not sufficient? Okay, well, they're using this turkey starter like I was, 26%. I had no problem. Uh, groups of five to six hens in one room. That's okay. They clean the pens. No matter what you do in metal cages, your quails are eventually going to, when they get older, they're going to look ruffled because they're in a metal cage. They're not oh, with an open pen where they're on an open floor or free range. Because you, you look at chickens in a rain cage and you and you look at chickens like ours are free range. There's no comparison in the feathers. You can do everything right, but you will often get a ruffle look. Okay, greasy, I'm not sure, but I've never seen greasy. But I don't know what she means by that. But I would say she's doing everything right. If it's a ruffled feather she's worrying about, I wouldn't worry about it. She said they have plastic floors and they were hatched in the spring. So spring, they get into that seven to eight month age. Again, like that's when we turn them over, right? So if they were hatched in February or March. Uh, uh, everything there that she, she's doing looks good. The only thing is, is I've never really seen mine look greasy. Now that could be whatever they're using for dust, maybe. I'm not sure what they're doing there. Uh, she said there's it's dirt, ash, and some DE. Detox. Uh, de di di diatomaceous earth. Yeah. Powder well, there. I, I've never used that for uh, pen. I don't keep a, a dusting pen in my cages all the time. Every now and then I'll skip one in a pen and I just use normal sand. And they love it. They, they just love it. But, you know, in, in a 48 by 16 point cage, if you got large birds, you don't have a lot of room for a big dust pen in there. Okay, so sure. you, see, you give them a dust bath once a week or something. And, well, that's what I do. And they do, like I said, they do good. I've been doing it for 36 years. <laughs> Works okay for me. So she says that by greasy, it's like uh, their feathers are matted. It's like a matting. And she also puts sand in the in that the mix. Sand in the mix, yeah. I I don't have that problem with mine with the feathers matting. And the, the only difference between mine and hers would be in her dusting materials. So I'm only not sure. The, uh, only the amino acids are right. right. I mean, I, sorry to cut you off, Barry. I wonder if her amino acids in that feed are right and she's not getting proper feather development. The protein might be there, but the amino acids may not be right. Uh, uh, I don't know what I don't know what company she's using too, yeah. because I found a difference between co-op and surrogate and what's the other one we could buy around here? It's this one down sold in Alberta. I found a difference in the feeds when I, you know, I said, oh, I can get 30% down here from this mix. Took it back, used it a couple of months, tossed it, wouldn't go to it. I went back to the 26 from UFA. It's master feed, so. Yeah, I, it should be basically the same feed, I would think, is UFA, what I use. You, you'd have to get the takes and compare them. I've never done that. Yeah, Christy, if you'd like to send me a label of that feed that you're using, I can email it to um, to Baylor, who took care of your chicken rations, and he can take a look at them if you'd like. Yeah, I'd be I'd be interested in knowing too. Like, what's I wouldn't mind a copy of it so I could compare it to what I buy from UFA. Sure, because I can go into UFA. They don't. I've been buying since the store opened twenty five years ago. They they let me go in and allow. <laughs> I can go in and take it in and compare to their feed in there. See what's the difference between the two. Yeah, you're welcome. We're here to help. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd be interested in seeing, like I said, it's, everything else she said is perfect, is working, is exactly what I do. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have another question? If you'd like to post it, 
we can move to there it. There was one from Lore, just before Christie's. Okay, let me go back. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You can take any color, and this is something else that I've had arguments about. I have took every color of Creole I have, and by doing selective breeding over seven to ten generations, you can get them up to minimum jumbo size. Color doesn't make a difference. If you have a color that you want to make jumbo faster, find the biggest feral, feral natural color. That's the original color. Find the biggest normal color you can find. Breed that color to the, the jumbo. Breed those chicks back together and you'll have a head start in making that color jumbo. I've done it with every color I've had. Okay, here we go. Um, I've been really happy with Co-op Turkey Starter. I find my quail did better on that than the master feeds. Now, see, I I had uh, I tried, I, tr I I tried UFA against uh, UFA against Sergi, and I like UFA better. I've never bought Co-op. I've never bought the Co-op feed. And uh, Laura says, gives you the thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you do you record this meeting? Uh, you record it someplace? Yeah, yeah. it's uh, uh, Facebook records it automatically, but I usually take that recording and um, work with it to make it look more presentable so i cut all the technical issues at the beginning when we do the testing to make sure that uh you know that all everybody's mics and all that is working so i kind of clean it up and then i post it on uh, rumble and youtube so it will be available online definitely okay that's great because i would i like to collect the ones i do because then somebody comes and they say i can't find it i just send it to them <laughs> Yeah, no, all that will be available online. I just get need to get my um, tech guy to do that for me. That's my son. He loves to do those kinds of things. He's done all the others. So once we're done here. And yeah. thanks, Guy. I, I, I appreciate your information on the formula. When you had that screen up with the Creole mix, I actually took a screenshot <laughs> and saved it on my computer so I could have it. <coughs> So I, I now have a copy of that. Yeah. So we have a question here from Christy. I believe she's down in this in Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly, from the beginning. What do you suggest for layer feed? This is probably for the, those guys. Yes. Can we do a screen share again? Sure. Okay. Uh, All right. You got it? Yeah, yeah I got it. And I'm going to put it on full screen <clears throat> so that you have the most. Yeah. So normally we work with a 20 to 22%. Um, again, if we have the amino acids balanced out right and we're doing it right. Um, now, I built this one on a much smaller scale for someone who wanted to, you know, mix it at home in their own bucket or wheelbarrow or whatever so they could go get their own ingredients. Um, and put it together but yeah this is a 20 percent um it's not a real high energy and um the me poultry or the kilocalories per pound of the energy um still keeping above average vitamins you know we're at 5900 vitamin a uh, 1600 vitamin d um, but keeping the amino acids up at a higher level you know lysine at 1.15 methionine 0.43 Greening at point uh, eight zero. Uh, sorry, I'm a numbers person. I'm probably driving people crazy, but those uh, amino acids are really, really important. You know, for keeping, you know, keeping the birds healthy, keeping the stress level down, keeping the production level up. So, yeah, and this will be on the video recording. You can come back and get it whenever you want. Uh, you're also welcome to email us at livestock 
and we can send them out to you. Um, <clears throat> we do do some custom formulations for people if they can't find a particular ingredient. Um, but yep, yep, these are these are available. These are these are public, free to the public rations. So uh, more than happy to share. So what size did what size did that mix up? Like did you mix a hundred pound bag from that, or that was a fifty pound. Fifty pound bag. That was a fifty pound bag. Okay, great. And, yeah, I mean, we we make formulas all the way down to twenty five pounders, Perry. So you know, yeah. people with three chickens, but they want to make sure they're fed right. So look, yeah, we don't, you know, we don't care what the batch size is. So I took a screenshot of it too. <laughs> okay, you're welcome to it. And if you ever need help, don't. That you know, would probably be similar to jeans, right? What you gave Jean? What's that? What, that would be similar to what you made up for my partner, Gene Grifton. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, except it's already figured out for a smaller weight for her. Yeah. I yeah. got yeah, a couple we, people who want to mix their own feed, but they don't want to mix a ton at a time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. If you need some smaller stuff like that, just let us know. And, you know, we'll, we'll do you that. Know, for people who just want to mix up, you know, a five gallon bucket, you know, or 25 pounds, we're, we can we can make that ration size whatever you want it okay so um and it, it may be a little bit less stressful than people than people looking at a 2000 pound mix or a 2200 pound mix or, oh yeah that's why i'd i'd love to do that quail mix you got but i just don't see it feasible for my size no mm -hmm. so here we have another question do we mix a suitable quail feed that we can purchase in alberta no we don't mix feed what we do is uh, sell in Canada the Fertrell mm -hmm. vitamin and mineral premixes. So if you were mixing your own ration or even if you're working with a commercial one, you can sometimes add some of that to it. Um, it's called Poultry Nutri Balancer. We have uh, the Fertrell Aragonite. So we don't mix feed, but we make those uh, high quality vitamin and mineral supplements. Uh, available to people in Canada. So that's what we do at Tiga Acres. Now, can Victor up the road, Gascon Milling, could, would he be able to make them? And Yes, that okay. was my next, that was my next, uh, yeah. uh, that was my next point. Mm -hmm. Gascon Custom Milling lives, uh, they're located just a few, not even a mile, I don't think, on the road from us. And uh, he can do custom mixing for you. He only does custom. And um, he will, uh, if you send him a ration, so let's say that you'd like a ration made, we can be in touch with uh, Jeff, Baylor, and Rachel. They can make up a ration for you with the ingredients he has. And then you take that ration to him and he'll mix it for you. So that's totally doable. Um, other pickup points. No, we are in Sundry, Alberta. So I'm not sure where you are located. Uh, we do travel across the province, though. My mm -hmm. husband works as a civil engineer, and he is all across, and he's able to deliver most of our orders. So if you'd like to contact uh, to contact me at this email address here, I'm going to put it back up or read here. If you'd like to send me an email there, we can make arrangements and you know, see what's doable for you. I can send you the information for Gascon Custom Milling as well. So now let me, there is Christy, maybe a silly question, but I'm new to doing my own feed. When you do custom rations and you want oil added, how do you add the oil? Straight into mixed ration or fed somehow separate? Baylor, Rachel. Flip a coin, come on. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> you can add it straight into the mixer actually whenever you're mixing the feed and Jeff could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you would wanna add it slowly after the majority of the commodities are added. There yeah. you go, yeah. you got it right. <laughs> and, and going along with that, you can add any oil that you have around that's convenient for you. Um, so if you can just take anything that you might have in the kitchen available, 
Um, if that's easiest for you to do, you don't have to use anything specific. All oil for the most part is going to add the same amount of energy. Um, obviously, if you're looking to stay soy free, you wouldn't want to use soybean oil, but you can use any oil that you have available. I have a friend that makes his hand feet and what he uses is one of those big spray bottles. So every, when he's mixing, he'll mix a while and then he'll spray a bunch in and then he mixes some more and spray. Seems to work good for him. He's, he's doing it the hard way, Perry. If you just dribble it on, on the top, like you were putting it on your salad or something, then, and then mix it up, it works fine. Yeah. That's okay. He's he's yeah. always done it that way, and he likes it so. Well, he must be scientific type, or you know, somebody that's very fussy. So, hey, look, his way works, and I'm not putting it down. But I'm. This I dribble think, works too. Huh? Yeah. This dribbling it in works too. Dribbling it in works great. So yeah, I'm going to tell him that. Okay. Next question. I've got an egg from you, Perry, about five or so years ago. Thank you for doing this. I am aiming to raise about a thousand birds a year, and this will help make things more efficient. All right. And, um, Hope it does. Yeah. Do you have other pickup points? Yeah, I can uh, help you with that uh, via email. Uh, if you'd like to, to email me, I'll be happy uh, to help you that way. And uh, Christy says, great, thank you. So that's the end of the questions that I have so far. If anybody else has anything more, feel free to post. Perry, it's too bad you're so far away. I'd love to pick your brain for about a day and a half. So, but yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I, I love talking to people. Uh, yeah. Last year, well, it'll be over a year now, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. I, I have older brothers and sisters that 10 in my family, and six of them are older. So I, 4 o'clock in the morning, you figured somebody died, right? Yeah. It was a guy in Malta in the Mediterranean <laughs> calling me because he had just bought Schofield Sober Collection eggs from a guy in Germany. <laughs> And he was so excited, he called me long distance from Malta, but he didn't figure in the time difference. <laughs> <laughs> then he talked for he talked for almost an hour in his time. I, I guess they must have better phone rates over there than we do in Canada. <laughs> so I, I, I get calls all the time. Yeah. I, I love to talk birds. Yeah. My partner tells me I talk too much. <laughs> He is a man of few words, he your is. partner. So that's probably why he feels that way. Yeah. I, when I get talking about my birds, I could talk all day. <laughs> that's what he said when I called him to see if he would do that with us. He said, Oh yeah, he'll do that for sure. <laughs> he loves talking about birds. Yeah. I have another question from Christy. Do you give your quills grit? Uh Again, it's not something I keep in the pen all the time, but I have like a little cup that every now and then I'll stick, kind of rotate between my different pins. So every second or third way, it's very hard to find really small grit. The smallest, I like to get the smallest I can get to put in. So, so yeah, I, I usually end up giving them pigeon grit. This is about the smallest I can find. So Jeff, how would that compare with the uh, starter grit? It's about the same size. You're looking at about a sixteenth of an ounce or a sixteenth of an inch, um, you know, one to two millimeter type size. Um, that's probably fine because he's not keeping them past eight months of age when they really, you know, um, they probably would eat the next size up towards the end of their life, you know, if it was important. But to cover all the bases from chick all the way up, um, you know, the starter grit, you know, that fine grit would be would be about right yeah you know I, it's right i just put it in like maybe once every three weeks four weeks i put a little cup for four or five days in the pen and that's it yeah if you can do it perry i'd like for you to do it more often you know so um it, it just increases feed efficiency not that you're not having any efficient feed but the more that gizzard works in there the healthier the birds are so it it, it could take you to the next level and so like I said, the small grit you can buy for most pigeon suppliers. 
Yeah. 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 If you're looking, if you're looking for number one grit, the starter grit we carry it year around in, and it comes in fifty pound bags. So I don't know what the pigeon grit comes in because I don't. Uh, I, the last bag I got was twenty pounds. Oh yeah. So we get A medium we, size bag. Yeah, so we we get it in we get all size grits from one all the way to the turkey uh, finisher. So we have we have all that available. I know that it's not easy to find. Yeah, a lot of people uh, tell me that that they usually can find a number two grit at their feed store, but they can't find the one, and then they can't find three. And I'm not even talking about turkey. That's just not around. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my problem. Like I can get the two, but I can't get anything smaller up here. With right. The, 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 the. Yeah. So, um, do we have any other question while we still have our guests? It's a uh, let's see, seven. It's nine o'clock for you guys in Pennsylvania. Right. It's my bedtime. So. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm always yeah. watching the clock, thinking. My wife just came in and said, "Do you want supper tonight?" <laughs> right. So <clears throat> that's the call right there. When when Barry uh, says, says yeah. yeah, we don't want to keep him from the supper. No, it was a great show. I like yeah. my food too much. <laughs> well, it was nice being on with you guys. And yeah. Like I said, uh, if any time if you have press, you want to call me, go ahead and call me. I don't mind. I could talk your ears off for two days. <laughs> yeah. All right. we need, I was gonna say we need to get Perry back on with some pictures of his quail and stuff like that. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I, I, I changed my. I actually went out of everything except for my silvers. I had a guy keeping them. Two and a half years ago, my knee went bad. I, I, I couldn't do my chores. I actually knelt down in my dooryard and I couldn't get up. I had to get help to stand up. There was nothing to hold on. So I sold everything but my sobers. My sobers I gave to a guy and he kept them going for a year until I had my knee replaced. So then I was able to get back to them. <laughs> good. Yeah, no, that's good. Oh, here, I have another comment here. Let me go back. Great show, Rip Stalvi. Yes. Yeah, he's, I'm pretty sure he's bought eggs for me before several times. That's possible. That's, I don't know if he's... Uh, if he's done quails, have you raised quails, Rip? I've always, I've heard you talk about chickens. I, I know I've sold to a stable, so maybe, is he in Alberta or Ontario? No, he is down in the States, I think, is it Florida? Oh, no. Then yeah. it's not the same one. I yeah. would love to export to the U.S. I get requests, oh, every, oh, every couple of months I'll get two or three people. Can you export to the U.S.? But it's so expensive. The, the, the rules they have to export from Canada, and it's, it's, the rules from Canada are also much tougher to export than they are from the States to export this way. Okay, okay. So I got celadon eggs from you, Perry, but none of my hens lay celadon eggs. So I oh. need to get back to celadon. Yes. The chicks, once you cross out to celadon, every bird hatched from that will carry the gene now the normal hatch rate if you if you're doing like a first or second generation i find the hatch rate is for every four or five hens you'll get one usually that lays celadon egg you can tell if the hen is carrying the celadon egg if it's a even if it's normal color if you break the egg and look at the inside of the shell it will have a bluish tinge to it that means they got the gene it just didn't process into an egg in that generation. So if they take if they take a male hats from that group and breed it back to the hens, they certainly should start getting in the second generation, at least a couple. My red celadons now I'm on to generation three or four. I think it might be four. And I'm getting about fifty percent of them now, the chicks that hat laying celadon eggs. Warning. There are people in the U.S. who bred several generations celadon to celadon, and what they found is they got to 100% celadon eggs. The birds got smaller, 
were less healthy, poor quality birds. They actually stopped breeding them after they got to 100% because the health went down. It, it was too much of the, I don't know what it, why, but I've had several people tell me that they no longer breed celadon because the birds were not as big, they got smaller, and they were less healthy. I've never gone that far. This is the, what I'm doing this generation is the farthest I've ever gone with celadon. It's three generations celadon to celadon. So, and like I said, I'm up to almost 50% now, the chicks are in southern eggs. She says that she doesn't know which roux has the gene. Yeah, see, that's, if, when I had chicks from southern eggs, because again, you gotta, if you wanna get southern, you gotta go, why do you have babies? The chicks that had from southern eggs, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, I know. I take a fingernail clipper, and I clip out the hind toe and uh, the, the back toe on one leg. And that's because when I hatch chicks, I, I've got eight colors hatched, right? I put the salad on eggs, but when I'm raising a hundred chicks, maybe only 10 of those in that bunch are hatched from salad on. Now, if you're only hatching from salad on, you don't need to do that. But I would suggest for the first generation, so she knows which males are carrying that gene. If you want to make salad on, you got to mark them somehow. And quail are so small, I've never had any luck putting any wraps around their legs. I've tried food coloring on them to keep them separate, didn't work. I've tried, you can't get parakeet bands, I tried, and they'll fit the, the day olds. But the problem is the coternics grow so fast. Unless you're checking bands every two or three days, it just doesn't work. So I'm probably going to get 50 emails now that I said that. Crew, I'll be crew. Uh, it's no different than people who pinned in their ducks. If uh, people who raise the fancy ducks, they don't want them to fly away. They pin them at a day old, right? So they don't fly out of there if they want to open roof. Same idea with this. And if you're breeding celadons after the first generation, if you had some separate, you don't have to do it. But you got to get a male with the celadon gene to do it. And I believe that I remember Christy bought Seldon eggs, but she also bought other colors at the same time. So if you don't mark them somehow, you won't know. And now I'll get ready for the emails. <laughs> <laughs> that when I said about leaving the Crayola, I told several people online I left the Crayola for the winter. You wouldn't believe the nasty emails I got for how cruel I was. And, So I'll, I'll put up with that. <laughs> okay, so she's saying good tips, thank you. And this was to marking the, uh, the mail, I believe. Yeah, well, yeah. you don't know when it's a day old. Or so. it, maybe, maybe it's, yeah, she said she bought some black quails as well. So she's yeah. got, she's got. Yeah, both. she bought blacks and that. Uh, the blacks also, I now have in the blacks, I've been introducing the salad on gene into the black. I have some celadons now laying, uh, some blacks laying celadon eggs. I, I, I just love the blue eggs. I, I put it into all my, I put it into all my colors. It's in them all. So. Actually, I think she might have got some black eggs, from four or five eggs from the black celadon that was celadon from the, my black hens. All right, so now we are at the end. <laughs> I think we are at another, at an hour 30. So what yeah. I'm thinking is anybody who sees this show as a recording, if you have any questions, just contact us with any questions you might have. And um, anybody who might, who was here and thought of some questions, feel free to email us. If you're in the States, you can email uh, Jeff and Baylor and Rachel at livestock at .com. If you're in Canada, I'm happy to help you at tigaacres at outlook.com. If you'd like to contact Perry, I'm going to put his email address here again. And then so we can follow up after this. And uh, we're going to leave it at that. We're going to let Jeff, Baylor and Rachel go to bed. Yeah. And 
<laughs> Period. Before I leave, guys, I just want to, uh, from the, the feed guys, I just want to tell you that we love your feedbacks. Thanks, Perry. Yeah, Appreciate we, that. We really like it. It's We've seen an improvement in both the chickens and the quail. Even just the quail used the chick style, it's worked good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. I am going to go have supper. Yep. <laughs> so you all have a good nice evening. Oh, okay. Right. Nice Talk job. to you soon. See you. Yeah, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming and for all the questions. Bye. Bye.